Welcome to Hearing God's Voice podcast. And today we have hope to pour out on you. And I hope that you're looking for hope because the man that I as a guest today is going to be really sharing some of the real life Christianity, the real life experience of intimacy with Christ. So let me introduce him. And I hope I don't mess his last name up, but it's Greg was in this key. <laughs> <What? What? laughs> I mean, really, it's how I know telemarketers are calling. So yeah, it's uh, Wazinski and, you know, good old Polish kid from Garfield Heights, Ohio, where I grew up. I love those old memories of, you know, 50 Polish people gathering for the holidays. And even though we don't get to do it anymore, they're, they're certainly great memories. But good to be with you, Jeffrey, and thanks for having me. Good to have you. Boy, I'm excited. Uh, I love the name of your ministry. It is precious because it, it's let me be dot, dot, dot. And I want the audience to know a little bit about that ministry before we really get into the depths of your teaching of hope and the power of intimacy and the real thing of uh, what we're going to talk about. So how did let it be dot, dot, dot ministries come to be? Well, so, you know, it was not my plan. Uh, this was purely God's will. Uh, I spent many years fighting it, and I can look back and see how long I spent fighting it and how often I gave props to secular uh, hopes, but it, instead it was really God driving me. And uh, to save you a very long story, when, when I finally found out through a change in business direction that God had something special for me, uh, I went on a silent retreat. And I had never done it before in my life. I went and I spent three days with the monks up at the Abbey of the Genesee up in Pifford, New York. And uh, I was very excited to be able to work with the monks and talk with them and walk with them and just exude their holiness. And uh, so I drove five hours to get there and I was excited to do all of it. And then I found out that their day started at 2.30 in the morning. So that, 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 was, <laughs> that was kind of strike one, but I'd driven all that way to be there. So I, I, I was gonna go along with the game plan. Uh, but I went that first night at three o'clock in the morning and, and I was praying after they were done. And I normally pray, you know, let me be a good father. Let me be a good husband. Let me be successful. Let, all the things that I want to be. And that night I could not get past the words, let me be. It was as if, you know, we read about Zechariah in scripture or, or other figures where no speech would flow from my mouth other than these three words of let me be. And I think after about five to 10 minutes, the Lord figured out that he was starting to lose me. And uh, <laughs> he spoke to me in a very clear way. And he said, Greg, I don't want you to finish that prayer. Just be nothing more than what I've created you to be, and all you desire will be yours. And so as the ministry has taken on its own life, it is the reminder that when I say, let me be, or any of us say that, uh, we shouldn't finish that sentence. It's up to God to finish it for us. And so basically as a ministry, uh, we're full-time missionaries. This is our livelihood. This is the way that we uh, share our vocation with the world. And it really is meant to accomplish three things anywhere that we travel or anywhere that we're seen online. And that is to inspire individual hope and faith, to encourage communities to come together, and to most importantly, uh, restore the value of family. So that is our work as a ministry. And we do that in any different way that someone can hear our voice or read the message. Oh, that is just precious. Let's, let's zoom in on the first portion of that, what you shared. God spoke to you. And obviously on the podcast, hearing God's voice is so important. So many people hear that. And I know you've done so years now in ministry. The first question is, did you hear him? Was it an audible voice? Um, describe to the audience how God spoke to you. And then if you wouldn't mind also, was there any affirming ahas that came from God's voice when he spoke to you? Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Ahas, or like, oh my, I, I think it's kind of the, uh, the the good way to put it. The voice that you hear of God is really, it's an inner voice. And there are many people that don't get to experience this or are silent long enough in order to hear it. Most of the time in silence, we want to put some sort of other distraction in there so that we don't have to think about the things that we don't want to think about. And I will tell you when when I went on silent retreat, the first day was hellacious because there was many things that I had a focus on that I had put away for years. Mm -hmm. And so this openness to 
feel God at work. And the only way that I can describe it, Jeffrey, is that there is a peace that you feel throughout your entire being, that as this thought fills you, this voice of God speaking to you, that you know it can only be him. And it, and it really does change you. And the, the moment that reaffirmed uh, what I had heard that night, because afterwards, anytime I gave my witness, anytime I traveled to give a talk in a church or a community, I was telling this story of let me be and, and be who God created you to be. And I gave a talk locally, uh, not too far from my home. And there was a woman that came up to my wife in the grocery store about two months after I gave the talk. And she said, you know, I was at your husband's talk a few months back. And she said, now I wear a bumblebee charm on my bracelet as the reminder to be who God created me to be. And that woman, I would later learn, uh, went on a three-year battle with cancer and is in remission. But I, I love to believe that God is always walking before us. And so that affirmation of what that meant to her and anybody that we know that has a, a B, whether it's a key charm or a, a t-shirt or something like that, that it's just that reminder to slow down. Don't be what the world is telling you, but instead be who God created you to be. And that ties two scriptures together. You know, when you said about that peace, you know, Philippians 4, 7 says a peace that actually takes us out of, you know, transcends from what we're thinking in an everyday noisy world. And the other one is Romans 12, which is kind of a keynote for this podcast is Romans 12, 2 says, no longer be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And I think that what you just shared with the audience is so important about hearing God's voice because we are transformed, but on a daily basis, because we can get back into the noise because we're in this world, but not of it, but we're still working, playing, being parent, being husband, being wife and being kids or whatever we're being. But we need to have those constant reassurance and conversations and dialogues with God so that we can truly maintain, as Timothy was told, the fan into flame, the gift that's already been put inside of us. I think that's so important what you share. Well, sure. And, you know, for all of us that we have to go back to these reminders that, you know, Jeremiah had no plans to be a prophet. Very, you know, it's only two prophets that actually wanted to do the work that God was calling them to do. And he tried to make a lot of excuses. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in chapter one, uh, Jeremiah submits to the voice of God saying that before you were in the womb, I knew you. Mm -hmm. And by chapter 20, he's proclaiming, you duped me, O Lord. <laughs> and I let myself be duped and violence and outrage is my message. Like <laughs> when we give our life over to God, we think it's going to be some world of like Disneyland, right? Where everything sings and the birds are everywhere. And, and we find out that we are given a cross. Mm -hmm. And the cross is okay to bear because, like you said, it, it, in Philippians, it tells us that it transcends all knowledge. It transcends all being. And if we allow the unknown and the unseen, if we can trust in that in God's will and God's nature, it's out of our hands. And, and I think it's troubling for some people because they want to know how you can get there and I can't. Or and quickly. what I've learned and, and the basis of what you talked about at the beginning is that our faith is not something that we can live and worship on a Sunday. It has to be lived Monday through Saturday as well. And if we spend our time seeing God in the world around us and don't expect uh, to just find him in worship, but instead we already know where he's been that week, then when we worship him, then when we go to church, we have an encounter. We have an experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where the Lord takes us to the mountain, shows us what's possible, and then says, now go home and do the work in the valley. So mm -hmm. it, it just, we have to live it. We really do. And, and believe what God is telling us that stop trying so hard. Be still and know that I am God. Okay. Yes. And, you know, that's uh, such a precious uh, relationship. Uh, I was sharing with my son earlier this morning uh, who runs my private practice. And he's been challenged over the last you know, eight months. I don't even know where we're at with this the pandemic, but he's been growing and and growing and growing. And then you know they've been with me since the very beginning. They were they were hearing God's voice and journaling literally as soon as they could write. But the reality is, 
there's a need to practice that. There's a need to put that into practice of our life. Again, as Philippians 4, 9 says, to put into practice these things that we've heard or listened to. The important part I share with him this morning, because he was really struggling, and he said, everybody's calling me with all this bad news, and everybody's calling me and sharing with me things that are happening here and there. He said, I'm trying to fight it, but I'm just, I'm getting worn down. I said, Manuel, here's what you do. I said, you have to hear God's voice in the midst of what seems to be the valley of the shadow of darkness, so that when you get through it, James 1 says that if you persevere, you will lack nothing when you go through this process. You'll mature. I said, that's what the good news is, that God's working all things together for the good, even in the midst of the valley, even in the midst of the difficulty and the circumstances. And I said, when there's darkness, do you know how powerful a little light is? You just bring a little bit of good news, just a little moment of, of hope, and boom, the, the light comes into the darkness. The darkness is gone. It's gone right. for that moment. But you have to put it into practice. The discipline is so important to every day because you said can't go to church and think you're going to get it because i've always shared with people if you're not journaling and, and hearing god's voice and reading the scriptures every day when you go to church don't ever say that your pastor priest or, or minister should be having the word for you he's really there to confirm to confirm the word in the koinonia of the greek word community to confirm what god has been saying or correct what god has been saying to you all through the week and we miss that we start to depend on man again, pastor, priest, minister, whoever it is, and no longer is it an intimate relationship like you talk so much about in your book, an intimate relationship, it becomes, I'm just a you know spectator. And you know what? God doesn't want people sitting on the bench or pew. <laughs> he wants them in the game. And I think that's what you continue to talk about. Even in your book, tell us about the book that you wrote, which I know you've got a number of books, but the one about real life has really kind of caught my eye. So where Faith and Real Life Come Together was a book that I wrote uh, to help people see that in this journey that we take, uh, and I started out very specifically. I mean, it, it's a book of 31 short chapters that allows the reader to pick a title that might be relating to what's happening in their life. Uh, they don't have to read it through. They can kind of pick and choose as they're going along and answer questions uh, during each chapter. But I did start the first three chapters intentionally, and, and that was to tell somebody that Number one, we're part of a community of believers and that we are the church. Number two is that things happen in God's time, not how we see them. And lastly, that prayer is a simple conversation. You know, I, I grew up as a cradle Catholic and for 30 some years, I didn't understand why I believed what I believed. Hmm. And it wasn't until God's call into ministry uh, certificate to better understand this aspect of why I was taught what I was taught. But in all that time, it wasn't about the prayers that I memorized. It was about the ability for me to have that conversation, to have a conversation. I remember that, Jeffrey, we're talking about a conversation means that we need to hear God's voice back. It's yeah, That's you're right. It's a hundred percent back and forth. Mm -hmm. And until we begin to allow ourselves to do that, nothing is going to change because it's just going to be us telling God, what we want in the book over the years it's it's funny the chapter that gets the most comments emails or after a presentation where people tell me they read the book is the chapter that i wrote on the unconditional love of my first dog that amy and i had when we were married and you know people relate to that people relate to a pet who has unconditional love, who is always there through everything, never worries about an argument that you had earlier in the day, but 30 seconds later, they want to show you love. And mm -hmm. I always think like, this is our relationship and how God works with us, this unconditional love that says, no matter how far you've been from me, no matter what's happened, I just wanna love you. And if you'll let me love you, you'll find all the joy and all the hope and everything that you need in the world. So. Mm -hmm the separation that we feel in the humanness of a loss of a loved one or a, a pet or a, a business situation and feeling failure and hopelessness uh, allows us to understand that if we turn away from the unconditional love of God, we are going to experience that time and time again, and we need to surrender. That's right. Boy, that's really well said because, you know, until there is communication, I, I was raised up a Catholic uh, boy and I loved my Catholicism because I was kind of outside the box. Uh, I always felt there was a 
personal relationship before I heard about a personal relationship. And I could never figure out why everybody was kind of just, you know, God was there, we were here. But in turn, it doesn't become a relationship. It doesn't become intimate until you have a conversation, a dialogue, as I talk about. We do a journaling program, workshops and seminars, uh, Greg, that teach people how to do what David did. Where David, example, Psalms, he would write his frustrations, his victory, he'd write whatever he felt because he was in personal relationship with his best friend. Then in third person, God would speak to him through the Holy Spirit and he would write those words down. And then he was transformed by the end of the Psalm. And we teach how to document that process. But then the most important part is then tying it back to scripture that all those things have to have a tie-in. So it's not just a fantasy, but it really becomes a reassurance that God is speaking. And it's even putting it to the basis of 2 Timothy 3.16, that the breath of God is being spoken to you through Scripture as well as the dialogue of your own personal translation, which now makes it even more personal, don't you feel? Well, yeah, it's not just words on a page. I mean, Scripture is a living, breathing document that God is showing us revelation. We are not ready to accept everything at one time. Uh, St. John Vianney once said that in the Catholic Church, for the true believers, that if we really understood the Mass, we would die of joy, right? Because <laughs> I love that quote. <laughs> yeah, it would be so overwhelming that if you truly believe that Jesus is present, then you would be so overwhelmed that mm. you, your human senses would basically, you'd want to explode. but. This aspect of understanding that what scripture does by doing, and I love what you're talking about with your journaling, that what that does is that gives us the reassurance to show us in all of these messengers that he sent and all of the people that have been present throughout salvation history from Genesis to Revelation. All of these people, all of these stories that exist throughout the entire Bible are there to reveal a story at the right time and at the right place. Scripture is just vital for us to understand that. And you know, you said living, and this is where a lot of people who read the scriptures, even beautiful Christians that are trying to seek their faith, they read scripture still for literary or knowledge and not realizing what you said, it's a living being. It has life to it. That's why today I could read the scripture that really means something to me so powerfully in a circumstance and situation for this moment. Ten years from now, because I write in my Bible like crazy and I you know, put dates and I put notes of what's going on. It better be so messy. Read, yeah, it is messy <laughs> and color-coded like the rainbow. But in turn, ten years later or a year later or a week later, it can have such a new reflection. And someone gave me an example that I think you would like. He said, if you looked at a diamond, but there were five people around that diamond at different points of the diamond, Jeffrey, you would see, he said, the diamond in a brilliant blue light. But somebody sees the fraction of the fracture of that light in green. And but when you put all those together, you have the beauty of the diamond. And that's like God's voice. That's why we need community. That's why we need koinonia. But the power of the word to be living, I think we miss that message because, again, we fall into that literary book that is a Bible that is holy and all those things versus saying, this is a love letter. And I you know my daughter-in-law, uh, I had a birthday, gave me a card. Now I had some beautiful presents. I mean, some beautiful physical, you know, material presents. The words that she wrote on mm. this card, Greg, I keep it on my desk because it makes me come to tears and brings that, that, that motion and moment again and again and again. That's how the scripture should be speaking to us, where it's a love letter from the lover to the beloved, like out of Songs of Solomon, that really truly talk about how he seeks and desires to love us first so that we would love him and receive his love. Yeah, th there was a great movie uh, a while back that was made from the book uh, Joshua. And, uh, you know, it gives the real life account that if Christ came to a, a town, but didn't look like what we think Jesus would look like, but he just came as an everyday guy and began to do miracles, how would people begin to accept them? I, I hope I don't ruin it if people haven't seen it, but you should see the whole movie because it's a really neat thing to, to ask us the question of, if Jesus walked into our lives, would we recognize him, number one? And number two, at the end of the movie, he actually has an encounter with the current Pope of that day. And, you know, the Pope recognizes him as Christ and says, what do you want me to tell the people? And he says, I want you to tell them that the story hasn't changed. 
and that I love them. And I get goosebumps just saying that because so often uh, in our life, we have to know that we are loved and that the story hasn't changed. And that, th as you said, this is a love letter. Hmm. And, and Jeffrey, I, I, I've said it publicly and, and, and I don't know how some people take it. And I know that we have different Christian faiths and different denominations, but I'll tell you about four years ago, uh, I thought about leaving the Catholic church because I didn't know how God was using my abilities. And, and I wasn't called to be a priest. I wasn't called to be a deacon. But here I am, this layperson who's called to evangelize and bring hope to people. And so I thought, Lord, are you asking me to be a pastor somewhere? Do you want me to go and start my own church? What is it that you need? And what I realized out of being quiet and hearing his voice again was that if I leave the Catholic Church and I don't help people fall in love with Christ the same way to have that personal relationship and to understand the beauty of the foundation of the documents that exist, so that they can have a, a growing living relationship with Christ. If everybody leaves and doesn't help the largest following of believers, then what am I doing for them? I'm walking away from Christ's biggest opportunity to help conversion happen. Mm -hmm. And we need conversion because on a Sunday, I will tell you that only 30% of the people in the pews are actually paying attention to what is happening. And if only 20% are showing up, that means only 6% of this Catholic faith that I'm part of understands why they believe what they believe. Not only do I share my lo love of Christ with all Christians and all communities, but especially in the Catholic faith, that we have to understand that it is not just what we're told in these documents that we memorize, mm -hmm. but instead how they reveal Christ and how they relate to Scripture. And then we can grow in faith. So I think we all need to do our part in our center. And boy, the, the day that we all come together, what a glorious day. What a glorious yeah. day it'll be. That's a beautiful, beautiful obedience to God's calling. So it's always easier to run away from wherever we're at that doesn't fit or where we think we should be or to let me be <laughs> in yeah. another place. I love that. I love that. You had uh, talked about four points of reference uh, about um, knowing God, loving God, serving God, and of course, someday being with God. Give us a little dissertation on those four points that represent a teaching I, I enjoyed watching that, on your YouTube that was really just wonderful. Yeah, so that actually comes from the first three paragraphs of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. You know, that we have four responsibilities during this lifetime, to know God, to love God, to serve Him, and to someday go to heaven. And uh, later, as that same document tells us, that you know the desire for God is written on the human heart. We are made by God for God to return to God. And anything that we do outside of that, anything that we do separate from God's love is empty. And this is why our world has become so empty as we shut God out or as we fill our time with technology to not be still long enough to hear his voice, that we forget that to know him is to be willing to see him in the world, right? And we have gifts from the Holy Spirit that come. Wisdom, understanding, reverence, knowledge, courage, right judgment, and wonder and awe. Those seven gifts of the Holy Spirit help us to know God in the world. And to love him is to love our fellow man. And to not love our fellow man just to do anything that they want, but to give them truth and love. The truth that is found in scripture but the same love that Christ was willing to give Zacchaeus, that Christ was willing to give Zacchaeus or the woman caught in adultery, like he just meets them where they are. And to serve is to not be comfortable, to not go to the soup kitchen because it is something that we're doing to feel good about ourselves. Mm -hmm. But uh, as the uh, theologian John Bergsma once said that, what good is a cup of soup if we're not trying to save someone's soul in the process, mm -hmm. right? So every time that we do service with our hands and our feet, it's an evangelization opportunity to transform the heart of another person and to save their soul. And lastly, to return to heaven is to say that we are not made for this world. You said it before that we are in this world, not of this world. Mm -hmm. So our goal has to be heaven. Our goal has to be that uh, we are helping others. Uh, or as the philosopher Ram Das once said, that we are all just walking each other home. It's a beautiful sentiment to say 
It's my job to get you to heaven and it's your job to help me. Everywhere that I talk to people about how do I get my kids to go back to church? How do I help my friend who's in a broken marriage? I always tell them, please remember that line that I said earlier that the desire for God is written on the human heart, made by God for God to return to God. And that has to be the focus of what we do. And when we separate ourselves or we compartmentalize worship from living our faith, God's going to ask us about that on the day of salvation. And it's going to be a hard question for us to answer why we weren't willing to do the hard stuff as much as it was the easy stuff. What you just described is interesting because man puts so many labels and so many, whatever we want to call it, framing around and trying to create religiosity instead of a relationship. And if you look at Jesus, he stayed right in the, the Hebrew, you know, faith to bring the message of salvation, to bring the message of freedom, to bring the message of what Isaiah 60 uh, talks about. And he also, wherever he was, whether it was the prostitute in the street, whether it's a leopard, he was always ready to say the same message, but with that compassion of intimacy, knowing that he was doing it for the father, not for his rewards or gain or any other purpose. And when we do that, again, back to Colossians, do all things, no matter what it is, as if you're doing it unto the Lord. And you talked about that, I think it was a theologian that said, if we really, really knew that Jesus was really right here, right now with us, our whole life would change a incredible amount of degrees from the way we think when we're going good to where we really could go. Now, Works never create salvation. We know that thanks God, thank God Jesus Christ did that on the cross. But the reality of paying it forward and paying it back and saying thank you comes from our actions of living Christ-like lives. And I think that's what you've just described so well for us to learn from. Yeah, and you know, quite often, you know, even in James, with the faith without works is dead. It's like this isn't an either or; it's a both and. You're right. There are many people that do works and they don't have faith, and they and they don't accept the grace of God. Uh, someone once explained it to me as a spiritual director. They said the grace line of God is like a pipeline, right? So He's pouring grace into us. We, with our free will, have the ability to push that pipeline away and to not accept that grace. We become uh, ultimately like a rain X where it all just bounces right off of us. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we have to reconnect that severed pipeline in our lives to say, Lord, I've tried it every other way. And today I want to give you the hope. I want to give you my goals. I want to give you my victories. I want to give you all of it. And it's why I love the story of the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew's gospel because the disciples run to Christ to say, Lord, we have a problem. There's a lot of people that came to see you talk and it's really late. You need to tell them to go home and get some food. And then Jesus's response is like, will you tell them? And they're like, well, wait a second. You want us to give them food too? Like you want us to spend 200 days worth of our own wages to feed a bunch of people that came to hear you talk? And I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but, mm -hmm. but then he says something to them that I think is so profound. He says to the disciples, what do you have to offer? And in that moment, he takes five loaves of bread and two fish, and he feeds everybody there. And in the end, there's 12 wicker baskets full of fragments left over. Mm -hmm. Why this becomes important is that, number one, whether it's our tears or our victories, God will take them and multiply them to make sure that they feed. Your story comes in contact with everybody that needs to hear it, and they are uplifted by it and find inspiration through it. And then the leftovers are meant for all the people who weren't present to hear Christ's message that day. And in the same way in our lives, when we share our story, our testimony, our witness, and our love to surrender it all to Christ and to give Him the glory, that will inspire people that you will never meet because the original people you spoke with go out and tell your story to more people and it grows. And that's how the leftovers would have been used to feed all the people who weren't there that day. So we have a lot of work to do, but we have to let God be God in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it is an amazing gift to be able to do that. You know, I was uh, journaling one day and 
it was one of those moments that I'm sure you've experienced many times where you just sense that spirit of God just filling you up and you know he's there and he's speaking to you in a fluid way of dialogue. And I, I, I just came out like, uh, you know, a lover. I said, uh, Lord, how can I love you more? And very simply, he said, Jeffrey, love my children and tell others of my love. When I went to my journal and, and tied it back to scripture, of course, the greatest commandment is love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your might, and love others. And I think that we start to see how this love affair really takes all the barriers and all the, the titles and all the framework that we put around his message in religiosity and really bring forth the freedom that Isaiah 60, that he read off the scroll the day he was in the temple, that blew everybody away because now in my hearing, you've heard this, he says. So it really is a blessing to know what you're doing, Greg, for the, the body of Christ. And I'm going to just ask our listeners to pray for you and pray for your wife. Amen. You also have a special event coming up very soon. Uh, can you give our audience a little bit of heads up on that? I'm going to be actually teaming up with my wife, who's a uh, former actress in musical theater, uh, to do some songs and to share some inspiration about the journey of Advent and about mm -hmm. how we all really need to return to Christ. Uh, you know, the, the focus of what we do, and, and Jeffrey, I think that all of us need to think about it this way throughout our entire lives. We are the manger that holds Christ. We are the manger in which God places the most precious gift that he could send the earth into our care. And how do we put him on display for the rest of the world to be able to experience his love? And so when we return to him, when we come back to the creator for the fixes and the, the polishing and everything that we need, only he can restore us to the masterpiece that we are. And so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to inspire. It's, a, it's an event for the whole family. All of our videos and all of our audio resources, including our live stream events, are libraried on the website, faithinreallife.com. So we keep that up there. Well, Greg, we're going to put down all of those uh, contact information and your book and how they can get that. And uh, I want to thank you. I want to open the door to a future inv invitation to be with us again. Anytime that you've got a message that God puts in your heart, you just call me. And I'd love to do uh, another interview. You are inspiring. You are real, just like your book says. And I'm glad that the Lord took that prayer, let me be away, and is allowing you to be what he's created you to be. Well, so thank you. you. And this this is a pleasure for me. And 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 I love that we just found out an hour ago that we are from the same hometown. So we will have, the, we yes. will have coffee, including this. And, we uh, surely will. and I, God bless you for what you're doing, too, because your story I read is amazing. And uh, I need that. I need to know that there are other workers in the vineyard on the days that I get tired. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I accept those prayers from all your viewers. And, and I pray for you uh, and all that you're doing. And God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, listen, you've heard some precious, precious words. And I say this almost every podcast. Don't just listen to this one time. I have a transcript for you down below that you can see every word that was spoken, every scripture. You've seen them. If you're, if you're watching this on YouTube, you've seen them on the screen as well in the one thirds. But in turn, I want you to re rework this through your system. Allow the, the spirit of God to not just let you listen to 30 minutes and go off and running. Put it into a, a a, a, a real digestion of spiritual knowledge that will transform you. So listen to it, listen to it, and most of all, pass it on so others can truly be touched by Greg's story and by the stories that you would share with them as he shared with us. So until we are having again another podcast with you, beware that we love you. We are every morning on our morning session at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Renewing You with Jeffrey Paul. And you can be inspired there for five or six minutes, but we're here every Monday. And there's bonuses each week to give you more and more food for spiritual thought. Have a beautiful and wonderful day.